Hi everyone, my name is Becky Robinson and I'm so thrilled that you have decided to join us for today's webinar with Maya Hu Chan. We will be getting started in just a few minutes and we're so pleased that you have decided to join us. So as you're coming in today, we do want to welcome you to find the chat where we will be engaging with you throughout today's broadcast. When you do find the chat, we would invite you please to use the drop down menu to select all panelists and attendees. That way everyone who's in the event will be able to see your comments and interact with you today. So welcome, you have joined Saving Face with Yahoo Chan and we'll be getting started in just a few minutes. Thank you so much for joining us. And I would love to hear from you right now in the chat. We would love to know where you are calling in from today. It's always so exciting uh, to find out if you are participating in this training as a part of your organization. And if, if it's possible, I'll try to shout you out. Uh, so welcome, I see lots of states. Um, welcome in Utah, South Carolina, welcome in Nigeria. Uh, welcome in London. Uh, wow, these are fast and furious today. Uh, and I did the, well, welcome in Moscow. Wow. Welcome in Nairobi, Kenya. I love to shout out. Welcome in South Africa. Welcome to all these international people. Welcome to Erica in North Carolina. Uh, love to see you here again. Welcome in Bangalore. Wow. Welcome in Mexico. Uh, welcome in India. Uh, amazing international audience who's joining today. Thank you so much for choosing to be with us. Um, and as we get started, I want to let you know about a few technical considerations for today's event. Many times you will ask me about the slides and we will make these slides available to you as a PDF after today's event. And also uh, we will have a recording of today's event that will be available for you to watch again or to share with a friend or colleague. So uh, that means that you can relax and enjoy today's event. And if you choose to, you can also join the conversation on Twitter where there will be some folks live tweeting with the hashtag saving face. Uh, so welcome um, to Peter in Hoboken, New Jersey, where baseball's first game was played. Wow. Very cool. Welcome in LA. Welcome to Kristen in Columbia. Uh, we are thrilled that so many of you have cho chosen to invest an hour of your time learning today with me and with Maya. So uh, we're going to get started in just a moment, but I want to first take a moment to introduce you to Maya Huchan. Her book, Saving Face, will be launching on June 9th and is available for pre-order. We'll share some more about that later. But first, let me tell you a bit about Maya. Maya Hu Chan is a globally recognized keynote speaker, author, leadership educator, ICF Master Certified Coach. She is ranked in the top eight global solutions thinkers by Thinkers 50. She's among the world top 30 leadership gurus and top 100 thought leaders in management and leadership since since 1988. And Maya has been working with thousands of leaders, mainly in global Fortune 500 companies since 1988. Is that right? <laughs> so for many years, I uh, nearly, uh, I'm trying to think, I graduated high school in 89. So I don't know how many years that's been. Not quite, not quite 30, right? <laughs> Becky, are you More saying More than 30. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so Maya is also no the worries. president. Uh, she's also the president of Global Leadership Associates, which is a global consultancy that partners with organizations to build leadership capabilities and enable profound growth and change. So welcome, Maya. Thank you, Becky. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, I'm so glad to have you here. Um, and boy, more international uh, shout outs needed every moment. Welcome to Fred in the United Kingdom and to um, Mithun in Paris. So as we dive in today, um, we want to talk about first the journey that led you to write this book, Maya. Would you share a bit of that with us? I'm happy to, Becky. Um, as you had mentioned that, yes, I have had uh, decades of experience working with leaders around the world. And um, over the years, I have learned so much about their frustrations, their challenges, and also their success stories. And so I listen to them and work with them to help them become a stronger, more effective leader that I often share this concept that resonates with leaders around the world at all levels, at all different industries. And this is such an essential concept that, that for their leadership. But it is also counterintuitive sometimes, and it's the concept of face. Now, the face, face concept is a universal concept. It goes beyond its origin in Asia. And um, it, it really permeates all levels of social and business interactions. 
and it speaks to um, the common human desire to be appreciated, accepted, and respected. And when you hear the term, it's not about the money. <laughs> it, it, the real issue is often about face. Uh, so as I started working with leaders and continue to think about this concept, I thought it would be useful and helpful to write a book about it. And then, so it took me a few years to actually put it all together and really kind of um, combine uh, different experiences and also a lot of uh, real life examples in the book to really share with leaders on how this concept works and also some very practical steps and models that you can apply easily, quickly, and effectively. Well, and I know we're gonna cover a lot of those today and I'm so glad that you're generously sharing your insights with us. So let's start with this idea of defining face. Can you tell us a bit more about what face is? Yes, so the, uh, the de definition of face is that it represents one's self-esteem and self-worth your identity, your reputation, status, pride, and dignity. So you look at this, this is a lot. And this represents not only how you see yourself, but also how other people see you. And it's inside and out, it's the whole person. So that That's is the really powerful. Face. Yeah. So, and why do you think, Maya, that face has become our social currency? That's a good question. You know, as I think about uh, the concept of face, that I think about it's like a new social currency in our time in today's world. Now, you know, the more face you have, the easier and faster you can get things done. So just imagine that um, how we build a supply of face with someone when you started you know, a new relationship with someone. And by continuously making that deposit into that bank account with that in that relationship, you invest in that, you build trust, you, uh, we express gratitude, appreciation for someone, we compliment them, and we give credit where it's due. And uh, we also empathize with people. And we put ourselves in their position, and we also listen and honor them. And we give them their voice equal time and weight. And we continue to make that deposit into the, the, the bank account of face as we develop that relationship. And someday, when we need to make a withdrawal, and either we're giving a negative uh, or a constructive feedback to someone, or we actually accidentally cause somebody to lose face, that we know that we have enough deposit in there, in the account, that, that the relationship can still be saved and flourish because we have made those deposits over time. So that's why I think this is such, it's a great kind of a metaphor when we think about face. It's become our new social currency in our time. That's a really powerful concept. And I do have a question um, that's in the chat uh, from one of our listeners wondering, is it possible to have face when others don't like me or don't like my idea? So how, how do people get face? That's a great question. Well, you know, um, I'd like to like, introduce some of the concept first, and then we can probably think about, well, how does that apply to your question? If you disagree with someone or you have an idea that somebody, they, they didn't like, then how do you still maintain the, the concept of face when you work with others? So there are um, some key concepts about face. There are basically three things. Number one is that we call, I call honoring face. And um, well, actually, what we can do is, uh, Becky, we, I'm going to introduce the quickly three concepts. And I would love to hear from the audience about your experience. So first of all, honoring face. Honoring face is about um, making that deposit. And it's literally actually making that deposit into the account. And then we take actions to, to show respect, admiration, and grant dignity to others. That's the first concept. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a minute. Second concept is about we want to avoid losing face. We want to avoid causing someone else to lose face, and we certainly don't want to cause ourselves to lose face. That's the second concept. And the third one is actually the most important one is about saving face. And how can we turn the situation around when there's a potential 
uh, risk of someone losing face. So, um, but before we dive into those concepts, Becky, should we do a quick um, kind of interactive exercise? I'd love to hear from the audience here. Um, let's go to the next slide here. Now, have you ever, have you ever caused someone to lose face unintentionally? And what happened? So if you can put in your chat box real quick, and I think we all have done it. My, me personally, I have done it so many times over the years and I learned my lesson, right? Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of times we cause people to lose face, we don't even know it. So what happened? What did you, you know, say or do that, that actually caused somebody to lose face? So I see a couple of answers coming in. Uh, most everyone is saying, yes, they have done something to cause someone to intent unintentionally lose face. And the consequence, what happened, people are saying a relationship was broken. Um, Maria says she uh, evidenced a person that's lying, causing them to lose face. Um, inadvertent criticism. Um, Christine says it creates awkward moments. Um, yes, um, this happens when you point out mistakes in front of others. So when you correct someone in front of others, you cause them to lose face. Um, a lot of people saying lost relationship, cuts down communication, caused defensiveness, uh, the relationship suffered damage, uh, fortunately only temporary. Um, my friend, Marsha Reynolds happens to be here today. She said that uh, hey, she did this when co-teaching and it created conflict and hurt the students. Um, people unintentionally cause someone to lose face by interrupting someone. Um, by disagreeing with someone's idea in a much stronger way than they planned it to be. Uh, they got a hostile reaction. They lost relationship and trust. Um, there was shame. Uh, the person was disengaged. Uh, wow, we have like, this must really be hitting a chord because there are 54 uh, new messages <laughs> and I'm reading some yeah. of them. <laughs> wow, Absolutely. so yeah. uh, definitely cool. this is hitting a chord with people. Yeah, we have all done it. We're all guilty of that, right? And we're not intentionally cause somebody to lose face, but we have all done it. And, uh, you know, I like to sometimes think about this as kind of we're running like an autopilot. And when we're, you know, are busy, when we're, you know, in our daily work and things are going so fast that we may have said or done something we're not even thinking before we say it. And that can cause somebody to lose face and unintentionally. Then, you know, as many of you have mentioned that the consequence can be very serious. The cause of damage of relationship and then actually sometimes can, uh, can cause a, a lot, you know, your business relationship as well. So this is something that I think we, if we step back and then start thinking about, well, what can we do to actually uh, prevent that from happening? So let's take a look at um, what are some of the things that we can do. But first, I want to introduce um, the concept of honoring face. Okay, so what is honoring face? Honoring face is actions taken to show respect, admiration, and preserve dignity for others. Okay, and there are different ways that we can do this. You know, this is literally the way that you making that deposit into that relationship bank account. Okay, and how do you honor face? There, there, there are many very simple ways that you can do it. So let's take a look at some examples. Um, we can actually give, well, so that- the Oh, are we gonna do our poll first? Yes, I'm sorry to interrupt, Maya. Yeah, we have a poll on this one before we dive into honoring face. Um, yes. And I'm gonna go ahead and launch the poll. We are curious about whether or not you think your opinions matter at work. And we have four choices here. We have always, most of the time, rarely, or not at all. And we'd love to hear from you about that poll. Maya, while we're waiting for people to take the poll, there was a really interesting con uh, comment that we didn't have a chance to mention regarding um, unintentionally causing someone to lose face. Uh, Roberto said um, that he sees uh, an actual dollar uh, like losing money effect of unintentionally causing someone to lose face. And he said in, in all caps, face has an actual currency component. So that's really powerful. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Can cost you, uh, not, you know, it, it, you know, it, metaphorically and also in reality is it actually costs you money. It costs you business relationships. So, yeah. I think Let's that, take a look at these results together. Okay. So it looks like of the people on the call, 
um, 68% that most of the time they think their opinions matter at work and 17% said they always think their opinions matter at work. Uh, only 1% uh, two people said that their opinions don't matter at all at work. So, um, wow, that's wonderful. I'm so um, happy to see this result. So that means that 85% of the audience today actually feel like your opinion matters either all the time or most of the time. And that's very encouraging. Well, here is a statistics that uh, that uh, show Gallup found that only 30% of US employees think their opinions matter at work. Okay, and then so, you know, I'm um, giving that this audience actually felt that uh, your opinion does matter and that uh, you are being heard and that's very encouraging and, and uh, that's great. Congratulations. Um, and that's one way of honoring face. It's really about listening and honoring their opinions. So let's take a look at some examples of things that you can do as leaders and also um, whether you are a leader or individual contributors. There are many simple ways that you can honor face for others. For example, you can simply listen okay, and give their voice equal time and weight. You acknowledge their contribution, provide positive recognitions, thank people for what they've done, and you build people's confidence and res respect the hierarchy, age, status, and opinions. Okay, depends on which cultural you're in, and uh, sometimes the hierarchy really is a sign of respect and then it's also how you honor their face. Assign greater responsibilities and added visibility and also ask them to teach, coach, or mentor. And those are just some quick examples of ways that you can do to honor face. And there are so many other ways you can do to actually honor face for your team members, for your coworkers. So before we move on, we do have a question wondering, uh, Randy is wondering if you think some of these ways to honor face carry more weight than others. Uh, you know, I think that they are, it depends on, of course, the situation you're in. And, you know, I think the overall is, I, I like to often um, think of this quote from Maya Angelou. She says that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did but people will never forget how you make them feel, okay? Mm -hmm. And so it's not about doing one thing, but it's doing multiple things consistently to continue to make, a de to make that deposit. And you know, so by honoring face, you're sending a message to the other person. I see you, I hear you, you matter. Okay, so um, it's not one, one is more important than the other. I think it's really looking at the context and then you can apply so many different things ongoing uh, in a daily basis to continue to make that deposit. Okay, great question, thank you. That's really powerful. I hear you, I see you, you matter. Yes. So now let's move to the second concept. This is something that we wanted to avoid uh, as much as we can is to cause somebody to lose space. Now, um, you see this picture here. It's a glass of water that's built, right? So um, I grew up in Taiwan. And it's, you know, and when I was growing up that I often heard this Chinese proverb from my teachers and uh, um, the elderly and my parents telling me this kind of proverb. It says, spilled water is hard to regain. Spilled water is hard to regain. So imagine that you accidentally knock over a glass of water on the table and the water spilled all over the floor. How hard is it to get it all back into the glass? It's pretty tough, right? It's almost impossible. Now, even if you manage to put some back to the glass, do you still want to drink it? Well, probably not. It's not the same anymore, right? So what this proverb um, taught me is that we have to be cautious, careful about what we say and what we do. Because sometimes that if you've done something, whether it's intentionally or not in, unintentionally, that you can cause the damage that can be hard to repair. And then even if you try, sometimes it, it's, the relationship is not the same once it's damaged. So to be more mindful as leaders, to be able to kind of think before you act, and also to be much more aware of your actions and your words, and what is the impact on others, you may have the good intention, but if the impact is negative, it, it's still ultimately not the best outcome. So um, if we can get off the autopilot, 
okay, something that we, I mentioned earlier is that to um, get off the autopilot and then start thinking about, well, you know, it's like you're driving in a foreign country. We tend to make, pay more attention in, instead of just kind of going on autopilot. You pay attention to the, the actions, the reactions, and people's body language, verbal or nonverbal, um, you know, communications. And then you think about it before you take your action or, or uh, make your decisions. So losing face is something that I often think is something that it simply takes some attention for us to uh, think it through and uh, pause, push that pause button and think about it before we act. And that is what it takes, okay? Um, so I know that, that you know, uh, nowadays we are, many of us are working remotely and we're using technology to, uh, to communicate with people, our team members and our, our business partners. And this is particularly tough when, uh, when it comes to working remotely and using technology. So I think I'll give you a quick example. I have a, um, a client that is uh, actually, uh, let's just call her Linda. That uh, Linda works for a technology company. She has a, um, a virtual team that she manages. And she used this platform called Slack to communicate with her team. It's very efficient and uh, she used it to, to share information, assign tasks, and also she used it to give feedback. And when she did that, um, and then the feedback a lot of times is actually negative. And then she would point it out, something was wrong, and then the person on her team received that feedback, was actually feeling extremely embarrassed and, 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 and even humiliated. And then everybody else reading that same comment, even though it wasn't towards them, but then everybody else also felt bad for that person. And then that has a negative impact on them too, because then they start to feel like, well, I don't want to be just like that bad guy. So I'm going to be mm -hmm. careful. And so over time it become, um, they create, she has actually unintentionally created a fear-based culture in her team. And she was, um, people shut, shut down, they stopped communicating and uh, they don't take risk and they started to um, uh, disengage, okay? And this is something that, that you know, sometimes she certainly, she didn't inten intentionally do that. In fact, mm -hmm. in her mind, she was being efficient. She was being transparent and not thinking about the consequence. So um, after I st we started working together, um, I, I was her coach, then we gather quite a bit of data on that. And uh, she made a very concerted effort to change the way she leads. So the feedback that she provides, if it's, if it's constructive or negative, she would take it offline. And then she provide more positive uh, feedback uh, with the whole group. And if there's a, some a feedback that it will benefit from the, for the whole, whole team, she would actually uh, share that with the whole team without naming any names. So this completely transformed the way she, she led her team and it took her a good six months and consistently practice this behavior to turn things around and rebuild uh, the confidence of the team and the trust with the team. So, you know, when we think about losing face that the team members, they, they may not come to you and say, you caused me to lose face. We may not hear those words, but then you can see that the, the, the outcome, the reaction and the impact could be quite negative. That's really helpful. And I know it's something that many of us are struggling with as we are in virtual environments more frequently. Uh, so thank you for the powerful story. Um, so I, we're going to talk about saving face next. Yes, absolutely. What's so um, the saving face is the third concept, right? What it means is, is that uh, saving face is the authentic and intentional act of turning around a situation uh, to preserve dignity and for all parties involved, okay, for a positive outcome. And this is something that I, um, I think is so crucial to do. And, um, you know, I, um, very, very often I, um, I think about saving face is, you know, it's, it's a true practice to be a, a whole brain leadership. So very often I work with leaders who have very strong technical backgrounds and they are very highly technical, they're analytical and they focus on data and results. And then so, 
every day they operated focusing on their left brain. Okay, and a lot of times, so they uh, they focus so much on that that they're not fully utilize their right brain, which is the more creative, more empathetic, and create connections and really tune in with their team members. And then so that they can be highly technical and uh, you know focusing on the technical technical aspect of work. But then if the team member is not fully connected with them, then they can actually have a devastating outcome and the, the, the team cannot be performed at the, the highest level. So um, as we think about saving face, that there are many different ways in the book, actually I talk about how we can save face. Um, and uh, let me share one of my favorite stories with you, Becky, and, and with everyone. Um, so this is a true story that uh, a, a uh, let's just call this person Jeff. Jeff is the COO, I, I'm sorry, he is the financial director of a multinational company. And um, Jeff was facing a big crisis. What happened was that as, as financial um, director, that under his watch, a frontline employee had stolen over $100,000 in an eight month period. And you know, Jeff had designed and deployed this entire cash flow system that allowed this employee to commit the fraud undetected. And it was a high profile, profile case. It was discussed not only in security meetings, but also spread quickly throughout the entire company. Jeff felt entirely victimized, but then also personally uh, responsible for this. And he was, this was an example of losing face, big time. Mm -hmm. And very soon, the company's COO planned a meeting with Jeff and his team. And you can tell the stress has consumed Jeff. Now he lost a lot of weight. He couldn't sleep at night. And he de developed this rash all over his face. Hmm. And for days, Jeff just walked around like a, like a dead man walking. So when the day finally arrived, the team waited nervously in the conference room. The COO walked in and he broke the tension with just one sentence. He said, I don't care about the theft. He continued to say that the theft is unavoidable, whether you're running a hot dog stand or a multinational company. The company was insured and would be made, in, um, uh, would be made whole. So financially, we're gonna be okay. The COO said, I only wanna know that you plan to fix this problem. And from what I can see, you're well on your way. Hmm. Okay. So Jeff's demeanor immediately brightened. In the rest of the meeting, the entire team and Jeff and the COO focused on problem solving. And Jeff returned to his job with renewed energy. The COO had saved his face. Hmm. So what did exactly did the COO do? Yeah, what did the COO do? How did he do it? If you kind of look at how he, uh, he managed the situation, he created psychological safety for the team and for Jeff while holding Jeff accountable. He didn't let him off the hook, right? Mm -hmm. And he is he's still responsible. He needs to fix the problem. And the COO was kind and firm at the same time. He chose his words carefully. And he showed humility and emotional intelligence when dealing with this very delicate situation. And he helped Jeff, he helped Jeff overcome the shame and embarrassment quickly. And then refocus his energy on solving the problem and moving forward. So he sent this clear message to Jeff and the team. I, I trust you. Hmm. And I have confidence in you to do the right thing. And that was my That's favorite really story. Powerful. <laughs> That's a really great story. It's so powerful. Um, so that topic, uh, oh, I think that we want to um, engage our attendees again. I forgot we put this in here. Um, so we want to invite you now to share your thoughts in the chat. How can you build confidence and inspire excellence on your team by honoring face? And, you know, potentially Maya's story reminds you of a story that you've experienced and you can share your insights with us. 
I imagine that Jeff's experience in the workplace was completely turned around by that. Absolutely. And then he had a second chance to uh, regain his reputation and the self-esteem as well. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. it really was completely turned things around. And his team too, they were, um, they were, they were able to solve the problem quickly and, uh, and just move forward. So here's some comments from our attendees. Christine says, thank team members for their work and contributions. Uh, Susie says, credit where credit is due. Um, let's see, we have a bunch more coming in so quickly, just like on the last question. Uh, show appreciation regularly, believe the best in your team. Uh, being a host, not a hero is supportive for all. Uh, some conversations need to place privately. Uh, so important for you to set an example for others, especially senior leaders. Give team credit for what they do and make sure they know you have your have their back no matter what. Uh, normalize mistakes and be solution focused. Move from problem focus, bias toward positive core focus. Uh, Jeannie says, share this presentation with my manager. <laughs> Listen with empathy. <laughs> Assume positive intent. Uh, show respect and empathy to others recognize the contributor and team, acknowledge small successes, not just the big ones, acknowledge effort, ask for feedback and elicit suggestions, empower staff, let everyone give ideas and treat people with respect, uh, transparency, reveal a time in which you, the leader, did not honor an individual. Uh, again, just like before, we have so many comments here, so thank you everyone for your engagement. Uh, those are some really powerful uh, suggestions. Maybe they could be put into a blog post, Maya. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to read them uh, after the webinar, because thank you for sharing those. Yeah, I think those, those are, you know, real life examples that you can do. And really, we're not talking about rocket science, right? It, it's, it's things that we can do, um, you know, and it, it's small things, simple things that we can do to honor others. And also think about how can we actually help somebody regain their, their confidence and reputation by doing things that's kind but firm. So saving face, it's not about being soft or just being nice. And it's really about, you know, having that empathy, but at the same time holding people accountable. And then, then you can have the best outcome. That's really helpful. I love how you're uh, reminding us that it's not about being soft, but it is about being firm and kind. You need both. So let's talk about this uh, AAA model um, to more effectively lead culturally diverse teams. Can you give us an example also of how the model works? Yes. So the AAA model, um, it's, it's acronym that represents three steps that uh, leaders can apply when, when they work with cross-cultural teams or remote virtual teams and or simply very diverse teams. When we talk about diverse teams, um, you know, as we think about the diversity, we're looking at not just the cultural differences, but also the gender differences and also generational differences and also people's thinking style, personalities, all that we can apply to um, you know, working with diverse teams. And what can you do um, to really build positive relationship with your team and then still achieve the positive, the highest, uh, uh, highest performance with your team is to kind of in your daily interaction to think about those three steps. The first one I call aware. The first A is aware. So what that means is that you, you need to be um, first be aware of your own bias, your own assumptions, and your own behaviors. And this is the first step. And I often like to also, I love metaphors. So let me share with you another metaphor about this to, in terms of awareness. Um, I call this human antenna. Okay, so um, Becky, do you remember those old days? We have those old fashioned radio that we mm -hmm. actually pull the antenna up, right? What, yes. happened, yeah, what happened when, when the antenna was down? You couldn't pick up the signal. Exactly. You, you hear nothing. Or sometimes if the antenna is kind of low, you hear a lot of static, right? It's just mm -hmm. not clear. You, 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 couldn't, you couldn't get what was going on. You couldn't hear it. But then when you raise that antenna high, you'll be able to pick up a lot of different signals. And all of a sudden you could hear the music. You can hear what the host was talking, right? What people were talking about. So um, I like to think of uh, this awareness 
um, as we're raising our human antenna, okay? And if we have our antenna down most of the time, meaning that I'm just gonna, you know, um, you know, do things as I always do and not really paying too much attention about what's around me, what's happening with the people I'm working with, then a lot of times we don't pick up those signals and uh, we may uh, unintentionally create conflicts or cause somebody to lose space. Now, if we raise that human antenna, then we start to um, pick up different signals. We pay attention about what is said and what is not said. And we start looking at the higher context of what's happening in the environment. What is the person's reaction? And what was their body language? I mean, 93% of our communication is nonverbal based on the research. So how can we uh, you know, pick up those signals? Uh, it's really about paying attention, raise that human antenna. So that's the first A, it's about aware. Now the second A is acquire. Acquire means that we seek to understand the other person's frame of reference. So now put yourself in the other person's shoes, ask questions, be curious and have an open mind. Try to put yourself and understand where they're, where they're coming from and what they're going through and why do they think or say things like that. So acquire is an important step to gather more information. It's more outward focused. And the third step is to bring it all together, right? So you first you have that self-awareness and then you acquire the information about the other person. Then you adapt, you adapt your behaviors, you adapt your mindset, you take thoughtful actions to produce positive outcome for everyone involved, like what the COO did, right? Mm. The words that he chose, the action he took, it, it wasn't by accident. It's been well thought of. So, um, uh, let me share another, um, so share another true story. It's actually a funny story with you. Um, I have a, a client of mine that uh, is American manager that sent out an email to a team member that's uh, in, a, in, a foreign, in another country. And uh, this team member, uh, English is not his first language. So um, this American manager sent out this message to, uh, to this team member asking him to perform a task by a certain date. And it was a simple email. And then next day, he got an email back from this employee. Just two words in the email. No way. <laughs> he, was, he was not happy about that, right? He was actually a bit shocked. Wow, well, how dare you, uh, you reply this way? I'm your boss, what do you who do you think you are? So he was actually quite upset. And then, so he immediately started typing a uh, uh, angry email back to this employee. And as he was typing, he took a, he, he kind of sit back and then read his own email again. And he thought, wow, this come across very strong. And obviously I'm angry, but, and then he started thinking about this employee has been working with him for about a year. And then he's always been very diligent and getting the job done always on time and has never been impolite or, or um, you know, uh, in any way. So he thought, I'm wondering why he wrote this no way email to me. Well, instead of writing, writing an angry email back, let me pick up a phone and talk to him. So he, he, that's what he did. He picked that phone and asked the employee what happened. Why did you um, reply no way to my request? And uh, this employee was very apologetic and say, well, boss, I'm so sorry that the, the deadline that you gave me was actually, I have two other deadlines in the same week. And then, so there's no way that I could accomplish all of them in the same week. And then he went on to explain um, in detail about the other two deadlines, what he needed to do. So then this American manager said, Okay, all right, that, that, I understand now, that makes sense. Uh, that's fine, we can, we can let's, let's adjust the deadline so we can, we can you know, um, definitely modify that. But why didn't you explain this in the email? And then the employee said, well, you know, English is not my first language. It's gonna take me an hour to write this email if I try to explain this, and I'm so busy. Um, but, but I thought Americans, I watch American movies and TVs and people say, no way. It's like, you know, it's, this is, means no, right? So I, I want to be the, just like American, using American slangs. And so that's, that's how I respond. I thought I was being efficient and direct, just like Americans. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, that's uh, funny. 
that was fun. And you know, this they later on they had a big laugh about this. But you know, if you think about the triple A model, right? This manager actually applied that very well. Right? First of all, is that he was aware of you know he he was writing this email back and it was angry and then he realized that well wait a minute um i may have made a wrong assumption and then he acquired more information pick up a phone and um, ask questions try to understand what was going on and then he adapted he worked work, work out a new deadline he also realized that ah next time i'm going to i'm going to just pause and don't react too quickly so this whole thing can turn out very differently if he didn't apply the triple a model the result could actually be much much worse can actually damage the relationship so it's 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 a it's a true story and i feel that this is also how you apply this this can apply to you in so many situations now that is so powerful and i think we often forget that step of picking up the phone and when we rely on that uh, you know, email communication or electronic communication, we can get stuck in bad ways. Um, so uh, we have a question about this. Uh, Jake is wondering if the leader that you're telling the story about already knew about the, a, the AAA model. You know, that was interesting. Good question, thank you. The, he didn't know. <laughs> so uh, actually that was uh, something that I think uh, he was that naturally that he caught himself, right? And then so not knowing, but then naturally he, that he stopped and you know didn't let his impulse take over. And so it's pause, aware, acquire, and adopt. When he shared that story with me, um, he said, you know what, I didn't know about your model, but I, 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 you know, and naturally I did it and it was so helpful. And then so I think that a lot of times that once we are clear about a lot of times we didn't stop and think and uh, so to have this kind of quick model to remind us and then we can avoid some devastating you know outcome that uh, that we really didn't intend to have that's really powerful uh, and thanks for every everyone for your comments and questions um, so I know that one of the key concepts around FACE is this idea of psychological safety. So tell us a bit more about your definition of psychological safety and why it's so important with this concept of FACE. Yes. Psychological safety uh, is so crucial for uh, building strong, high-performing teams. In fact, the, uh, the this term, this phrase was uh, defined by Amy Edmondson at Harvard Business School. And uh, uh, Google actually also did a, uh, a very important study on this. Um, so let's first talk about the definition. What is psychological safety? It is a shared belief held by members of a team that the team is safe for interpersonal risk taking. Psychological safety is a sense of confidence that the team will not embarrass, reject, or punish someone for speaking up, okay? And so um, Google did a study on their teams around the world, and I believe it was 160 teams that they studied around the world, and trying to pinpoint what made a team successful and effective and performing well. So they look at many different factors. Um, they look at, is it the, 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 the um, you know, the, the education background of the team members, was it the, um, you know, their age group, was their technical training, was the, you know, they look at all different factors. Was it a cultural background, was their communication styles, all of that. And then they finally I pinpoint this one factor that is really the number one factor that uh, make the team function well, which is like psychological safety. And there are two key areas when, it, they, when they look at psychological safety. Number one is that they call conversational turn-taking. Uh, what that means is that when the team members get together, they meet, they, com they communicate, they share ideas, that everyone at the end of the meeting, they felt like they had the opportunity to communicate and say what they wanna say, and they, they don't hold back, okay? And they feel that they're being heard. So that's number one, this conversation turn taking. Everyone pretty much feel like they had equal amount of time to communicate. And they, uh, the second factor 
for psychological safety is about high social sensitivity. So the team members are raising their human antenna and they're paying attention to each other's reactions, whether it's uh, spoken or it's nonverbal. Um, and then they, they pay attention to that and then they, um, they also check in with each other. So they demonstrate empathy. So those are the two key factors for psychological safety. And when you think about psychological safety, it's directly linked to face, right? So when we honor someone's face, it's really about building that psychological safety, make someone feel they belong, they're being heard, and they're part of the team. And then when we help someone save face, also send the same message that you matter, and I value, I respect, and I appreciate you. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. When, we, um, when people don't feel safe, what happens? There are typically three different reactions. Number one is that they fight back, or they run away, they avoid the situation, they fight. Or a third reaction, it's actually at the workplace most common, is that they freeze. What happens when people freeze up? They shut down, they stop sharing their ideas, and they don't speak up, even if they see something was wrong and they stop taking risk, so um, they become disengaged. So when people don't feel safe, the team is very difficult to function well because then people are not fully participating and do their best work. Now, what happens when people feel safe? That's a, that's a completely different story, so let's go to the next slide. So when we feel safe, that, go ahead and click on, yeah, so, we're more relaxed, right? And we're more energized. We feel we're being heard. And people laugh a lot more, right? They, they laugh about things and they're joking around. And they also feel they belong and not just fitting in, okay? And then they also feel accepted, respected, and valued, okay? And then those um, feeling safe can directly impact how they show up and their actions and their behaviors. Okay, so let's go to the next box here. So then when they feel safe, they are more free to express their thoughts and feelings. And they're more engaged. They want to jump, they want to jump in and share their ideas. And they feel they, they trust each other more. And people are taking more moderate risk. And they're more creative. And they feel empowered to take actions. And here's the important point that when they feel safe, they focus on collective goals and problem prevention rather than self-protection. Mm. They shift their attention. It's not about protecting me or I don't want to get hurt, but rather it's like, that's not a, I'm not afraid of that. Let's focus on doing the best job we can possibly do to achieve the greater good. So psychological safety is so crucial for the team to be successful. And then also it's important for leaders to um, think about what can we do, to, what can I do, to build that culture of psychological safety. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that, uh, Maya. How can leaders create more psychological safety for their teams, especially with our virtual work world that we're in right now? Absolutely. Well, so when we think about um, creating psychological safety, let's go to the next slide. I have um, some ideas that I'd like to share with you. Now, there, um, I would say the first thing is you have to lead by example, right? Now, what that means is that, you know, when um, you be the first one to show humility and vulnerability, and it's okay to admit that you're wrong, okay? And share that, um, that your ideas, and then you don't have to know it all, okay? In fact, if you're the first one to show humility and vulnerability, others will feel safe to do the same. And then you create this no blame speak up culture that people are free to express themselves and the team become more creative and they are able to be more innovative and also you know collaborate and trust each other more like we talked about earlier but it has to first demonstrate by the lead okay so lead by example is number one and number two is to get everyone involved um 
the, even though it's very important for the leaders to, to really show, to demonstrate, lead by example, but then also it takes everyone to build that culture together, uh, demonstrate inclusive behaviors, hold each other accountable, right? So if you notice that the team, and you have two, one or two people dominating the, the, uh, the team meetings, or if someone is clearly feel, um, not being acknowledged or has been quiet or silent um, during our discussion, you know, everyone can speak up and say, well, you know, Becky, what do you think? We'd love to hear from you, right? And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, or, or uh, if somebody has said something and then you, you continue to, to support that person or reinforce it. So to demonstrate this inclusive behaviors and a daily conversation and interaction to continue to making that deposit into the face account, right? Continue to mm. build that psychological safety in your team interactions. And so the next uh, point here is that to, um, if you can, yeah, to master the art of giving and saving face. Now, um, the first thing I talk about is using straight talk. So what I mean by that is that straight talk um, is that we would say something, what, say what we need to say to the right person at the right time at the right place. Hmm. And we do so respectfully, accurately, and clearly. And that's what I call straight talk, okay? And then so the COO did that, right? And then he was able to choose his word carefully, and then he provide feedback. He also hold Jeff accountable. Now, what is the opposite of straight talk? I, what I've seen is that in the book, I actually give some really um, extensive examples that one talk we, we um, very often see is called blunt talk. So blunt talk is that I'm just going to get it off my chest about whatever is in my mind. I don't actually consider too much about is this the right time, right place, is this the right person? Is this considered respectful or am I accurate or am I clear? You don't think too much about those factors. You just say, I'm just going to give it to you. Get it off my chest. And so what happened when you do blunt talk is that the person who received that feedback, it's often felt being attacked. And they shut down, and sometimes they fight back. And the, in the very little chance that they're actually going to make any positive changes because they feel like they need to defend themselves. So blunt talk, it's often very damaging, it's not effective. And then the opposite of blunt talk is called safe talk. And what safe talk means is that we're so careful, we're so politically correct, that we dance around the issue and we drop hints, but never really address the the issue at hand. And then so the person who received the message walk away not knowing what's really going on. They may be scratching their head and thinking, what did my boss just tell me? Or what did this person try to say? Oh, maybe everything is just fine because it's so vague. And so being, doing the safe talk is definitely not a good way to save face. So that's why you know, straight talk is really a important um, sort of what we're aiming for is that we do want to make sure that our message is clear, and then we, we focus on the behaviors and facts so that the other person is clear about what uh, the expectations are. And then so you can actually have, take some actions to achieve the positive results. Um, and then certainly balance psychological safety and accountability. So should be kind, but firm. So those are some of the simple ways that leaders can do to create psychological safety um, for their team and also their organization. That's really helpful. Um, I did have someone ask if you could give a, an example of um, blunt talk versus straight talk uh, to help clarify that. Yes. So the blunt talk can be something like um, you would you get frustrated that when you are when you want to, you want to give somebody feedback and then you would say it in, in a in a staff meeting. You say, hey, Kelly, you know what, that, that report, um, when is it going to be done? Is you, you know, you're, you're late on that. Or I noticed there was a, a mistake there. You know, can you fix that? So blunt talk is something that it's not necessarily, um, uh, you, you didn't intend to, to create those negative impact, but you didn't consider is this the right place or the right time. 
um, to talk to that uh, to to give that feedback, and then the person may feel disrespected, or even being attacked, or they and then they shut down. So that that's a very typical blonde talk. And here's the interesting um, phenomenon that I often notice in a, in a, a team interaction is that sometimes we're giving a lot of safe talk. We're careful about dancing around an issue. We think we're clear of giving that feedback to the other person because we wanted to kind of minimize discomfort and, and uh, avoid confrontation. But I thought I already dropped the hint. You, you, I, you know, you should get my message. Hmm. And the person didn't get the message. And then so they didn't change and nothing happened. And then the leader gets frustrated and say, I told you this last week. Well, how come you didn't fix it? And then I'm going to tell you again, this time he or she is more agitated. And then they, then they shift to blunt talk. So uh, this kind of uh, 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 behavior, actually, it's very common. And sometimes we do need to step back and think about what, what is the balance here, right? You don't want it to be too safe and people don't get the message, but then you also don't want it to be too blunt that actually uh, uh, damage that relationship or, or damage their self-esteem. But then what can we do? to what can I do as a leader is to give that straight talk. So I will be able to um, maintain, preserve the dignity and build trust, but the person also feel empowered to make that positive change. I love that. Thank you so much. So I know that we wanted to spend a few minutes on Q&A, although we are coming close to the end of the hour. And I think that you had one favorite story about a leader who helped someone save face that you wanted to share. Did you yes. have a story for, for wrapping up? <laughs> yeah, well, wow. so um, I actually have a uh, um, funny story also. It's a, a, um, a leader that, um, uh, that I was coaching. And um, he, uh, one time I was on the phone with him and then he was actually told, quite upset. And then he told me, Maya, I'm so sorry. I, um, I just had a terrible call with my boss. And um, he's, you know, it didn't go well. So um, this client is actually from Singapore and had uh, years of experience working with multinational companies. And then his boss is American. So I know both of them quite well. So I said, what happened in the phone call? And um, this gentleman, this client said to me that my boss said, call me stupid. And I, I was, uh, you know, so I said, well, tell me more about what, what was the conversation like? And then he said, well, you know, we were talking about this new initiative and then we were brainstorming on different ideas. And then so I offered some of my ideas and my boss said, oh, that's a no brainer. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And so, oh, OK. So immediately I knew what the problem was. Right. And so then I explained to him what no brainer means, because in his mind that no brainer means you have no brain. That means you're stupid. <laughs> but then uh, in reality, of course, we all know what no brainer in a, it's American slang and it means it's obvious. And then it's no, in no way that the boss is trying to insult this employee. So once I explained the situation, then he was so relieved. And uh, you know, here's the thing that sometimes when we communicate that whether it is with somebody from a different culture or um, from a different generation or different cultural, different backgrounds that we do need to be much more um, aware and, and then, then we'll be able to communicate more effectively. And that this is something that, and then you'll be able to connect better and break down some of the barriers and help people save face and also help them honor their face. And then we will have much more long-term authentic relationship working together. That is such a good story and not one that we will quickly forget. So we want to thank you for investing your time and energy with us. Those of you who have attended, uh, we're so glad that you joined us for this conversation. Uh, Maya, I'm going to ask you a question in a second about how people can get uh, find out more about your work, but we do want to encourage you to go and pre-order Saving Face today. The book will be available June 9th, and we would love to have you pre-order it. We also will be having a virtual launch party for Maya on June 9th, 
the day that her book launches, and it will be in a Zoom meeting format where you may have the chance to ask some of the questions that you didn't get a chance to ask today, and we would love to have you come to that virtual launch party on June 9th, um, and Kelly has put that link in the chat. It will also be in the follow-up email, and we would love to have you join. Um, and Maya, before we wrap, can you share with others how they can connect with you, buy your book, and learn more about the services that you offer? Absolutely, I'm happy to. So you can see on the screen that um, just go to my website. It's under construction right now, but it should go live tomorrow. So um, that's mayahuchan.com. And uh, you can also uh, send me an email directly um, that's on the screen. And you can also order the book on Amazon. Um, we actually have the print version, audio book, um, and the ebook all available right now. So I hope you enjoy it. Thank you so much. And hopefully we'll see you all at the virtual launch party on June 9th. I hope to see you all. <laughs>